My name is Bill Daly and I'm the salesman, sales manager for uh, PEXCO, the Davis and Traffic Control Products Group. I handle uh, nine western states and I've been with uh, PEXCO Davidson for about eight years. I've been in traffic safety about 25, um, including having my own uh, little company for about four, four and a half years. And when I got into that, that's how I really got into uh, what I still just call is uh, traffic calming and the bike lanes and all those type of products fall under that. But Pexco has been in the traffic safety industry for about 30 years. Um, all of our products that we sell for um, bikes or for anything in traffic safety are all made down in our plant down in Fife. It's about 100,000 square feet of production down there, but we also have six other divisions. So, Texco makes everything from these diffusers on the lights that you see to aerospace. But I just happen to work for the traffic safety division and, and we use the Davidson name because uh, Bob Davidson, and that's where you see that little DP on the literature I handed you. Bob Davidson actually invented a little product we sell. We're still the world leaders in it. It's called a temporary overlay marker. And he invented that almost 30 years ago. And my boss, Peter Spear, has been working, he started with Bob Davidson, so he's been with uh, the Davidson Traffic Group for about 28 years. So we have a really long history in traffic safety. And the reason I'm here today is that going back about three or four months ago, um, of all people, our controller, we have a lot of people in our company that ride bikes and, and motorcycles and, and the like. And probably four months ago, our controller found something which was amazing that Peter didn't find it because he has more Google searches than anybody else I know. But our controller actually found that, I, that article where your group, someone in your group had gone out on the 7th? Oh, right. The uh, right underneath the overpass, I believe. I think it was 7th. Uh, reason it was about the black side. Shall I see you? Yeah. Uh -huh. Cherry. Hmm? It was cherry, yeah. 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 yeah, and did kind of a, uh, I can't remember the terminology that, that was used. Um, SP, uh, hit and run yeah, installation of right, post, yeah. Of and pop up. Yeah, That's what exactly. we often call it. Yeah. Yeah, so of course that, that got the attention of, of our controller, who then sent it off to Peter, and then Peter starts contacting me about why aren't they using our post, and where'd they get these from, and all that stuff. <laughs> I wanted to just be a smart ass and tell him, I say, haven't you heard of the thing called the internet, Pete? I mean, I'm sure they just want an internet. And, and bought it. But the way we sell, the way uh, Pexco, or at least the Davidson Traffic Control Group sells, is we sell through distributors. We don't sell direct. Like the city of Seattle, we don't sell direct to the city. We sell through distributors, and I have a number of really good, strong ones here in the Seattle area, down to Auburn. and up north and up in Marysville and whatever. And some of those guys have been in traffic sales almost as long as we have. So. Are they in, are there any in Seattle? In Seattle proper, they operate here, but their, their mailing addresses, no. Okay. They're either down in Auburn um, or up in, um, well, yeah, wait a minute, Ravana Street. Yeah, of course they do. National Barricade. Oh. Yeah, they're in. Right. Yeah, I always think of them as a district. But they, yeah, they have a Seattle mailing address. Yeah, they're up on Urbana. Okay. Mm -hmm. And National Barricade has been in the traffic safety industry for, I think, 50 years. And they're a good customer of ours. They sell a lot of our products. They sell some of my competitors' products, too. There's no real exclusive, you know, in our industry, per se. But the one thing about us, uh, about Pexco, Davidson, is we consistently push you know, high performance and, uh, better quality products. And that's really why I'm here today and why Peter wanted me to meet with you fine folks. And I really appreciate you guys coming out. I know it's not a pleasant thing to come hear a sales pitch from a salesman. I'm not really here to sell you anything except for sell you on quality. Because believe me, if you're, if you're going to go to the trouble of convincing these traffic people that you need more protection out there, then you want to really tell them, influence them, if you can, they need to get quality products. Because what happens invariably is even the cities, they'll go get the cheapest thing they can, and after a couple months, two or three months, they look really bad, they're in really bad shape. They end up taking them out, 
And then they, next time you come to them or try to approach them in a different area, they say, nope, we tried that, we're not going to do that again. You know, I'm not saying the City of Seattle maintenance or traffic guys have that agenda, but they have just, you know, been, and, it, and it's like every other uh, industry, every other product, uh, there's a life cycle of stuff, and, and um, it's a very competitive industry, so there's a lot of competition, a lot of people knock off other people's products. Our products are always getting knocked off. They look the same, but they are not the same. So, so speaking of getting knocked off, in my neighborhood we have these crosswalk signs. Mm -hmm. They get knocked off about every six months. Oh, knocked off in the other way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was yeah. talking about, yeah, got it. <laughs> those are amazing uh, products. So even when I had my own company, I sold a line of those. And there are some cities where they were replacing them every Monday. And, and it's... <laughs> I mean, down in the Bay Area, a city called, uh, named San Leandro, Every and month. it happened all the time. They would come back on a Monday, and they'd get a report, you know, one of that particular, that's a yield to pedestrian sign, mm -hmm. would be knocked down, they'd go out and look at it, and somebody had backed over top of it and spun their tires on it. And it's just, I just, for the life of me, can't understand why these people are offended by these little, simple, little products. They're out there to protect their own kids, their own citizens, and, they, and if they're in the middle of the street, there they're having, they're just doing it for fun, or they're doing it to get rid of them. I mean, it's not like these are speed humps or that type of stuff. It's just, it's a warning device. And, uh, a lot of the products we sell fall into that category. We're not trying to uh, deter uh, traffic or, or what have you. We're trying to influence them and just, and just send them a warning. Hey, there's something going on up here. You need to be paying attention to where you're going and how you're driving. And, Maybe you should be just acting with a little bit better prudence, you know. But yeah, those are the other bad signs. They, they take a beating. Yeah. Uh, the first thing I'm going to show you is actually a video, and, and I'm pretty sure you guys have probably seen this. Uh, we didn't put it together. It was... Um, Just hit enter. I worked on that product. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> that was not my fault, though. <laughs> <laughs> if something can ever happen, it happens in a presentation. I, and like I said, I don't know if you folks have seen this. It's a couple years ago. We didn't put that together, we didn't make it, but a lot of the products they showed are, were ours. So we've done a lot of work um, across the country and internationally in traffic safety products, obviously, and particularly in bike lanes back in D.C. and New York. I have the sun drive. I'll leave you a couple copies of it if you want more of it. Uh, there's available. Obviously, I'll leave you the literature. You have my card. Uh, we have a fairly good website that has a lot of the details of what I'm going to talk about. It's on there. And then for the engineers in the room, or you know, you, when you talk to the city engineers, most of them are aware of it because I've already given this presentation to the city uh, Seattle bike people two or three times, I think. But there's a link on our website to a, a site called CAD Details, mm -hmm. and on there are all the drawings and technical data, so when they want to put something into a plan, they just got to get it, drag it, and drop it, put it right in there. So, second thing I just want to go through is a little flyer. It's in the literature I gave you. It, you guys are pretty um, quick uh, review of what we call um, you know, a bike product line. Although all the products that, uh, that I'm talking about can be used for various different functions. Um, another thing we like to uh, promote is that all of them are meant to be uh, permanent, but they can be temporary. And that's a really nice uh, 
selling feature for a traffic engineer because when they go into a neighborhood and they want to do a, a traffic calming plan or they want to do a study or a trial, they're invariably they're going to get pushback from the neighborhood. Most of the people don't want these devices, don't really like them. Uh, but if you if you promote it from a sense where, look, it's a trial, it's a, these are temporary devices, they can be quickly removed and replaced with, like we were talking about earlier outside, you know, stamped concrete, you can do landscaping inside them, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a much easier sell. Uh, so these traffic people are pretty much generally, they, they've accepted that concept. And it seems like the majority of the times, um, and most of, most of the different uh, agency cities I've worked with over the last 20 years, they put these out as temporary and they'll end up staying out there for two or three years. Because after a month or so, the neighbor, they don't even notice them anymore. Yeah. They're still effective, they're still, still working, but people just get used to seeing them and they don't have the big objection to it. But, but all of them are designed to be quick removal. This is a asphalt bolt. Every, every uh, product we make, as far as these, whatever likes to call bollards, uh, we call them delineators or channelizers. They all have these uh, bases that are, are, we make them and mold them with these bolt holes. So they can be bolted down. Another thing we do differently for most of our competitors, and some of the other companies in our industry do the same thing with their higher, higher level products. Um, if you want to use adhesive, epoxy, or there's some flexible adhesive you can use. The real critical thing is you want to have a lot of surface area. So even on this base, which is our narrowest base, mm -hmm. there's a lot of surface area that bonds the adhesive really well to it. But yet, if they Except for the epoxies, because um, epoxies are pretty much permanent. They epoxy something down and try to remove it, it's going to damage the, the pavement a bit. But if they use the flexible bituminous, that type of stuff, there's some pads that we sell. Once the maintenance guys come out and they want to get these off, if they can get a spade or something in there, break that bond, they can pop it right off. And most of the time they can actually reuse. So a lot of the stuff that we have that we sell, um, if they put it in a, into a project and decide later on if they want to Put, put a more permanent what have you, they can actually take the products out, take them back to their shop, and reuse them somewhere else. So that's another good selling feature. Yeah, so tell us a little more about the, the temporary <coughs> ways to get these things on the street. Sure. Yeah, you're on the right page. In the back, there's, there's um, in that catalog, there's, like I mentioned, the bolts. Some agencies don't want drilling into their pavement. That's fine. I totally understand that. We have some, <coughs> some huge customers in the tollways uh, down in Orange County. Uh, they use our delinear posts exclusively. There's nine miles of them. They do not want to use bolts. So they use a uh, flexible bituminous adhesive. And I think there's a little mention of it in there. That's the only product we don't make or sell ourselves. It's, it's made by uh, a couple of different companies and they generally sell it direct to the, to the, man, to the contractors. When they get into that, they're talking about using these hot melt machines, and you're talking about miles of, you know, wrapping. They splurt it, they put the base, twist it, and then within a couple minutes it sets up. So it's kind of, but it stays pliable. It's a really good uh, adhesive, really good system for putting down uh, the bulk of the products that we sell in our industry. So that's called flexible bituminous. And but even you need it, to have a big rig to put that down? Or? Yeah, pretty much. There's some smaller ones. I'm sure you've seen the crack filling machines. You see guys out doing crack yeah. filling. It's the same machine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what would like a small community group who's testing out some of these products be able to do in terms of temporary? Cause mm -hmm. We're not going to have... You probably don't want to be drilled. drilled yeah. So there, on the top right hand corner there's a, a 795A. That's mm -hmm. a flexible adhesive that we make and sell. It's a very good, very good adhesive. Uh, relatively slow cure time, uh, which means it's going to take a couple hours for it to set up. Uh, but once it bonds and, and does set up, fully cures in about seven hours. It is uh, amazingly uh, strong, yet it stays flexible. And then if you do want to take it out a year later, same deal. You come, you get a spade, something that's underneath there, and breaks that bond. You can pop it right off, and it won't damage the pavement. And same thing with a month later, yeah. or two weeks later. Yeah. yeah. 
Now, if you're going to go that short, there's actually a product here called uh, Butyl Pad, uh -huh. which is up in the left-hand corner, and we sell millions of those, um, and it's a peel and stick. A lot of the maintenance guys use them. We don't recommend them, and we're not the only company that makes or sells them. There's a number of different companies, but we do not recommend those for permanent, yet you'll see them a lot. If they're not, if the, if the post isn't going to get hit a lot, then... It's not like it's going to fall over, but if it gets hit a couple times, a number of times, it's going to, those things to release. They're not meant to be uh, for permanent installation. Mm -hmm. But talk about quick removal, that's just basically the same deal. If you can get a little bit of prying force on the post in the base and just get up, break that bond, it'll come right off. And so this one's feeling a stick, and this one you can just do with a cock Yeah, exactly. That works. Yeah. And, and a lot of my distributors sell those. They stock them, they sell them. Mm, National Barricade, is it? Mm -hmm. National Barricade, and the other big one is uh, Alpine Products down in Auburn. He has a full-blown, you walk into his his showroom floor, it's really impressive. I mean, of all the distributors, he probably has the best. Uh, Which one? It's called Alpine. Alpine. Yeah, he's down right in, uh, on, in Auburn, right off of the C Street and the uh, 18 freeway. I, I can... If you want, you know, yeah, I can that'd be great. To Andres, yeah, and he okay. has fully stock. He's got everything, anything you can really? think of that has to do with traffic safety and, and uh, pavement maintenance type stuff. He's got a full showroom and, and stocks a lot of product. Hmm. I mean, he sells traffic paint, thermoplastic equipment, and down to the little little raised markers. Has a full stock of our post and, and the butyls and the you know, the. So once this is in. How does um, that attach? Or that post actually goes in with a different. Yeah, there's two little those two little nylon pins right there. Mm -hmm. So really, what I brought today too was three different ranges of these uh, products, and, and it all depends on you know, how much deterrence they want and how much money they want to spend. But the one constant for us is we always push again performance, but we also push for particularly for bike lanes, is um, the target values. The smaller the target value, the more effective the post is going to be, but that's the pin. Well, that's what do you mean target values? Yeah. Well, typically in, in these type of, of uh, delineator channelizers, you'll see an eight inch round base, and we still make sell millions of those, but in a bike lane, because you're, you're so constricted, it's shrunk down. Generally, it's a lane they take in, and, either taken up parking or, or, right. or made them one direction and they kind of squeeze in the bike bike lanes. So what we've targeted these products at is to uh, actually uh, complement pavement markings. Not necessarily to replace them, but to actually make them a little bit more effective. But on the other hand, they also minimize, we try to minimize the target value. So if you're squeezing into a bike lane, you're going to feel much more comfortable. I think she mentioned that in part of that, that video. You know, you wanna, not only do you want to get the bike lanes out, you want to get them protected you want to encourage people to use them so try to make them as comfortable as possible uh, this one happens to be um, what we call a metro base again our standard base is eight inches around this one's five inches it's just all the same way you can bolt it down you can use the adhesives but it's a really cut down so this is uh, five by base. eight yeah five by yeah i think it is eight that way yeah so you've taken off you know three inches which doesn't sound like a lot, but it, it does make a difference. And as far as the post, the height, uh, the color, we will make whatever the end user wants. Because we, we, we make these ourselves in our plant. We can make them any color, any length. We can, this is reflective sheeting. We can sheet them in any way that the, that the end user wants. Why would you have it you know, with that design as opposed to just circular? Is that just uh, years years ago, back in the 90s, uh, uh, when, again, my boss, Pete Spears, with the company, he decided to, uh, they were looking to get more into the delineator side, and uh, there's a, there was a whole range of products already out, or different concepts, and he chose to go with this particular configuration. It's called a T-post or cloverleaf, what have you, so it, and it has some advantages to it. It just inherently has a reboundability, but it's really flexible, really pliable. But it just naturally wants to spring back to its natural shape. So, you can it so we call that our FG300. That's still the bread and butter of our of our product line. 
but we also saw a need for, and in that catalog you'll see it, there's a round post as well, because some people just want a round, but round post. So we've had that one in there for a number of years, and as a matter of fact, one of the pictures I wanted to show you, this is uh, down by the Alaska Viaduct. These are the round, we call these DP200s. It's a relatively inexpensive post and base. has a full-size 8-inch base. And it can be installed with bolts, like I mentioned, or adhesive, you know, what have you. It's on page uh, nine. 9. But it's a very good, flexible, uh, delinear post that uh, Alpine and other distributors with the base and the reflective would probably sell that post for $20, okay. $25. Maybe. So what, what, one question, I, that, actually two questions. One was that with the pavement and the bolts, I know pavement can get a little crumbly if you try and bolt into it. Is there like, can you like put epoxy in the hole and then bolt it down? And you can. Then have more yeah. permanent. Yeah, yeah. We, we chose to go with these. These are self-tapping uh, masonry bolts. Yeah. Three-eighths, these are, obviously we don't make these. You can buy them off the shelf. There's other uh, products out there that, that uh, still require the mob, uh, sleeves or mollies. I don't know right. if you're familiar with the, It's the same kind of stuff used in construction. You right. drill a larger hole and then you pound the little plastic sleeve into it and then you can run this into that. So if yeah. you have crumbling asphalt, there's been a few occasions we've had people want to use that. And as long as it's 3 8 one thing we, we insist is don't drill the holes on our bases. Oh, right. yeah. We've had that happen quite a few times. And they actually can break the base, but as long as they, they still have a 3 8 they can anchor it in. Uh, when I had my own company, um, Recycle Technology was my biggest supplier, and their technique for doing the, uh, we, had, we had a rubberized curve, and we had a, uh, a rubberized speed humps and speed tables. Uh, uh, oh, hold on. Sure. <laughs> Hey guys, we have one conversation, <laughs> or, or, or just speak louder. Sorry. We're really excited no. about this. Yeah. Why are you excited yeah. about it? Uh, we were just talking about places to put it and like how the, you know, how, how you're bending it, or how cars are hitting it, things like that. Hmm. You know, like, are you bending it this way, or are cars bending it this way versus the other way? Which, which way do you set it up? Well, that's actually that's one of the reasons Pete chose way back when, more than 20 years, some years ago, to go with that shape post because it doesn't matter what. Mm -hmm angle it's hit from, it has the same reboundability from any side. Uh, there's a couple products out there, one of the ones I saw up on 7th I think, uh, and I think the city put that in. They bought a, a hard plastic post made by a company called Impact Recovery, and in it has a, a square base but it has a spring-loaded system in it. Now they've improved it somewhat, but years ago if that thing got hit from the side a couple times it would actually fall over. And it has steel c cables and pulleys. Our products have no metal parts at all, so they don't rust. They don't, uh, you know, they don't. And if they do happen to get knocked loose or what have you, there's no metal out there to deal with. So, but that particular post and, and our round ones can be hit from any angle and will come back up. These have been out there. National, I think, put that in. Gosh, three years ago at least. So that's something we've heard actually from the city's traffic engineers is that a lot of the posts out there aren't pliable enough in terms of if you're if you're biking along and you hit one it yeah. could it's, potentially cause a crash. It's gonna hurt. Yeah. Yeah. So is there a product that would be good on if you have a skinny little bike lane and you don't have a lot of buffer space and mm -hmm. you expect you know one to two people to hit it on a bike per year and mm -hmm. you don't want to fling them out in the traffic? <laughs> All the products I'm going to show you today can, can suit that bill. Um, some are a little stiffer than others. We, we make three different grades of that post, too. Uh, the lowest grade is a, is a polyethylene. It's a very good, but it's stiffer than what this one would be. can't twist it like that one can. But it's a price point of, you know, very competitive. It's really made for construction. Um, if it's out in the middle of an area where it's not going to get hit a lot, it's a fantastic post. There were some up on, right up the, I think it was Washington Street or some about two or three years ago. I happened to be heading out to get on to five, and I saw a whole line of them. They were in a, in a turn lane. That's not what that post is meant for, but unfortunately, you know, when 
someone comes in and they say, I want to bother it, I want to channel it. If you tell them these are going to be 50 bucks, and then you say, well, I have one for 15, that's what they go for. So. But even it, if you get if you run into it, it's not gonna it's, it's not a hard rigid plastic, but it's a little stiffer. But these, you know, these are very soft, very pliable. And you can run into that and it's not gonna really affect you too much. But they are very durable too. That's the other thing that we sell a lot of is durability. Durability is the fact that they're that they don't fade. They keep their color, they hold the reflective sheeting, because of these devices, if there's no sheeting on them, you're losing most of the effectiveness, because usually at night is where you want mm -hmm. these things to really jump out. You know? yeah. I guess it's kind of that hard line, because you want it to be durable enough that if a car hits it, it bounces back, but pliable enough that yep. if a bike hits it, it doesn't yep. send the person into traffic. Yeah, and we've accomplished that. I mean, we really truly have. I mean, that's that's been our forte ever since we got into the... So the, traffic safety system. The fifteen dollar one you're talking about looks like that. It one? looks a lot like it. It's got two little holes at the bottom, and you know I always go talk to my distributors. I say, come on, guys, upsell. You know, right. some of them do, some of them don't. I mean, for our purposes, one of the, the I mean, we have lots of different needs at this sure. table, but one of the big ones is creating a toolkit, basically, yeah. of what we see as a temporary, a pop-up um, set of these amazing traffic calming and intersection tools that we could and having a low-cost device that really we're talking about having up for short term sure. to demonstrate what could it be at this intersection or this area mm -hmm. it makes a lot of sense that especially if it I mean for the person on a bike who isn't anticipating that being there and suddenly mm -hmm. realizing I just um, it, very nice to have it be extremely flexible in yeah. the case of. Well, if you come away with one thing to remember today in regards to these channelizers, bollards, what are you going to call them? The word urethane. That's the one thing to remember. When you talk to, to the people that are buying them or specking them, you say, yeah, We're looking for a, a urethane post. That's key. Because mm. urethane just really lends itself well to. A, to our industry, our the environment that we work in, and a lot of the products we make are urethane based. Now, it's this one, this round one, and, and then the top of the line in our FG300 is a is a advanced urethane. It's even more flexible, but it's also much more expensive. You know, you're talking forty-five, fifty dollars for that post. So it's it's a hard sell, unless it's going to have high speed and a lot of impacts. Generally speaking, we're talking about bikes, these type of areas, a lot lower speed, not quite as much traffic. So if you try to sell a $50 post, it's pretty tough. So um, there's an intersection at Denny and Dexter where these were put in a little over a year. No, about a year ago. Um, and I don't know who the manufacturer was, but uh, similar base. Uh -huh. um, it's not spring-loaded. The one thing that I've noticed is they pop off at the base. Mm -hmm. And That's really cars great. are, it, there's a little bit of a turn, cars are hitting them pretty regularly, mm -hmm. um, and they're popping off at the base. Mm -hmm. Is that, I mean, uh, is there a way to minimize that? Are there different product qualities for minimizing that? not hit them. <laughs> because there's a lot more force um, at the base when, you're, when a car runs over the base mm -hmm. than, say, if, it, if just the front of the car hits the middle, the bumper. and then mm -hmm. it's just going to fold, but if it's at the base, it's just going to um, You mean if the, the basically so if the wheel, if, if the tire is hitting tire as hits opposed it. to, right. right. And so, I don't, I don't know if you have any insight into how... Well, uh, so you're saying it pops out, you mean the post is breaking or the base is popping off the ground? No, the base stays. Okay, so the post just the getting post, torn out, yeah. ripped up. Right, right, you've got those little plastic pins that yep. hold the post in. Yep. You know, it. I wonder if that's what's failing. If the plastic pins are failing, or if they're tearing out of the material at the bottom, it'd yeah. be interesting to get one of those after it's been ripped out and find out yeah. what happened. You, you, we'd probably look down the hole and see if the pins are still there. If they're yeah, broken. Exactly. If it's their product, it could be. A, yeah, I mean, it could be some different way. But I mean, is that a fairly regular thing that you see across the industry? The it is. Lines or? It is, and it isn't. Some some of the manufacturers, you know, they're a little bit better.
this is a full-blown presentation we had made up a few years back, and, and, and we just labeled it tubular markers or bollards. And some of the uh, things we address in here are the, uh, the quality of them. And it, there, it really is a difference between these products. They're not all the same. Some of them are so poorly manufactured, so poorly made, it's just unbelievable. The plastic is so thin, but these people sell them you know, all the time. And in our industry, we call them a one-hit wonder. We don't make anything like that. Now, the, the three grades we have, we have the low-density polyethylene, that's, again, the PE, the most rigid, stiffest. That one can probably take like 10 hits by a vehicle. And you get into that polyurethane or urethane. That's the one term I asked you to remember. That's a huge improvement. That post can take 40, 50 hits. Okay? And then you get into our extreme duty, which is a polyurethane alloy. It's a thermoplastic blend. That's our EFX. That one can take you know, 100 hits. Well, some of these areas that they get put into, 100 hits can happen in a month. You know? So eventually, they're all going to fail. I mean, if they get hit enough, it depends on what's running over them. I mean, you can't make them so they just won't fail. So there's a trade-off. You, know, you want to make them cost-effective, easy to put in, and then easy to, uh, to repair and replace. But yeah, all of our, of our bases and of the channelizers, like you mentioned, have the two nylon pins. So who's ever maintaining that, if it's the traffic department, that, that intersection you mentioned at Denny, they could easily go off. The base is still there. Even if the post is torn off, they can pound the two pins out, blow out that base, and put a better quality post in there. So the, that one base, all of our bases for our FG300 will accommodate any of the three different grades of post. So the base stays, they can replace it. So if it's getting hit a lot, um, and they're having to go out and replace, like for instance, they went in and they said, I want a you know, $15 post to get the PE. A couple weeks later, it's torn up and knocked off. They can go back out and replace it with the urethane. So, what's the poly polyurethane alloy in terms of? Is it a stiffer pose? Is it a more flexible pose? This is, it's actually the most flexible. This is it right here. This is we call it our EFX, and, and it can take I mean, like I said, hundred hits, so but it can also take it at really high speeds. So it's the most flexible, yeah. and, and therefore the most the for, forgiving on. Yeah. People on bicycles. If, if you have that one and the urethanes next to each other, you, the UR is a very good post. It's very cost effective. Yeah. And it's pliable. Um, you have them side by side, but the only way you can tell the difference is the sheen. This one has a couple more gloss to it. Hmm. So, generally speaking, with, with the bike folks that we talk to, this one's kind of overkill because you're not, as like Harry mentioned, you're not really dealing with really high speeds. But it is extremely durable, um, very fade resistant. Um, but they, they would probably be very happy in almost the I mean, vast majority of cases with the uh, UR, the urethane post. Very good, very pliable, very flexible. So, so <laughs> when, when you say a $15 post, is that the post or is that post. the post in the base together? Yeah, the together. PE. Yeah. Okay. Right and most, 20 bucks. Most of that is the base? Is that correct? Uh, no, most of it's a post. Really? Yeah. The base is generally your. 10, 12 bucks. And, and then you get into the 15 with that really inexpensive polyethylene, you know, the upper part of it, you know, may, maybe maybe $20 by the time you put the sheeting on and all that stuff. It depends on what my distributor's selling for. We have a suggested list price, but we don't dictate. We can't right. dictate. Can you just talk about the difference between the two? Posts, so you got like this little smaller post and a much bigger one. The, the yeah, the I'm gonna, base. yeah, the base. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah. no worry. That, that's what I was going to get to. Uh, okay. Another thing that that we do. Um, there, he's driving right over it. Yeah. Versus a lot of other manufacturers in in the, to operate in the traffic safety field, if you're going to do any kind of work, you know, out on the streets, out on the highways, you have to have your products what we call uh, NCHRP 350 approved. Okay. Years back, the, the, the states got together and they created a thing called National Test Deck. NETPEP is what we call it. So everybody who wants to get their NCHRP 350, they submit the products for NETPEP testing. 
we go above and beyond that. We submit everything we make. We take it down to Texas, and we, we, we turn it over to the Texas Transportation Institute. And we have all of these products tested at high speeds, multiple hits, bumper hits, tire hits, all that stuff. And it's not cheap. Every time you go down there, it's ten or $15,000 to get one, one series of posts tested. But then we compile the data, and then we use it you know, in, our, in all of our standards. <laughs> but that's what it ends up looking like. And in essence, you end up buying that car, because it's pretty much yeah. totaled by the time you get done impact <laughs> testing. But we're one of the few companies, and about the only company, that makes these type of products that gets them tested, and we have the documentation at 60 to 70 miles an hour. Okay. Again, that's not probably what you guys are really concerned about. You're not generally talking about speeds like that. So, has there been any testing for, for bikes? Impact. Impact. There's a little bit of stuff out of Europe, and I think, matter of fact, I still have it in here. Uh, for a couple years, we sold a really rigid plastic bollard, and in Europe, they have a standard of, of head impact collisions. Is that what you're talking about? When they actually, when your head hits the. Post? No, not. No, I wasn't thinking people, but no. You say that <laughs> people too, but I was thinking just uh, you know, little kids on bikes hitting them, toppling over. I, I, nothing yeah. that would be documented because you know, there's so many variables. I don't know how you would yeah. test it. You should set up a little test track in San Point. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to volunteer? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you'd, like, you'd, be you you'd be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're, they actually have a crash. Oh, they have a, a stunt training course. Uh, so maybe we can get that class to do it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Step driving the post. Yeah. For years, ever since I've taken this job, we've always had that. Like on the interstate and toll roads, I said, well, what about motorcycles? You know, have you done impact testing with them? It's the same thing. I mean, who's going to volunteer to do that? But uh, these devices have been out there for decades, and there's millions of motorcycles that ride by them, including the uh, traffic police and there's no big, huge doc database that says, oh gosh, they crashed on that one 50 times. You know, they drive by these things all the time and they don't have any problem with them. So. I feel like the general rule that the softer the thing is, the better. Yeah. yeah. And that's generally the higher the quality for cars. So, you know, crash testing. Yeah. I'm just wondering if there's like a break point where you, you know, where it passes over from hard to pliable enough. Be good to know if there yeah. is a standard that we need to be advocating for. I guess, I mean, I feel like <coughs> so many cities are putting in concrete and barriers and putting in planters and putting in, and not, I mean, obviously they're thinking to some extent about the impact. And of course, the narrower your space is, the more it's a concern, but this relative to so many of the other kind of barriers oh, that are out there, this is pretty flexible. So yeah. I think it's the handlebar hits that Don has. Yeah. Really I've heard concerns about the height of them too, right? right. That right. They, they, especially in a narrow bike lane, mm -hmm. they're worried about people's handlebars catching them. Mm -hmm. All the manual says, uh, again, and this is the manual that all of us in traffic safety live on, and it was rewritten in 2009, and then they, they debate it for a couple of years and then they adopt it. All it says is, relation to these devices is the minimum height is 28 inches. Oh. So above that is totally subjective. I mean, you can do any length you want. The most common, people always ask us, what's the most common? It's 36 inches. I don't really know why we went with that decades ago, but that's the most common. But we make them 42, 48. Yeah. Uh, we make some of them are 18 to go to the end of the islands. Well, it's an interesting, like in Vancouver, the planters were all low enough that for adults, the handlebars right. would go over. For kids, they wouldn't have, but. Yeah. So they are, I at least there, thinking yeah. about it. I can't remember, In San, I was just in San Francisco, and I'm trying to think about. Theirs are, how those are doing. 30, they use an inexpensive uh, one called Safe Hit, and it's, pretty sure those are 36, okay. I think so. Did you say you had uh, rubber speed humps too? No, not anymore. I uh, got out of that business. Uh, the company I worked with um, down in Tualatin actually went out of business. Um, there are still a couple companies around that make those. Does National Barricade have those? They, they, I know they have a, a, a parking lot version. 
and I'm pretty sure they can get them. Good. Yeah. Yeah, we're looking for residential street ones. Are you? Yeah. Yeah, the cushions or the. Yeah. It's been a while since I dealt like, with that, but they. Something you can drive over. Twice yeah, yeah. And there's hour. different. Not, not the not the parking lot. Ones. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and the there was a bunch of documentation done. Again, it's been ten years since I sold those, but the angle of the ramp yeah, and exactly. how much. Uh, Joel that gives to the vehicle, and then it goes the other way. Well, you don't want to make them too friendly because then the people just yeah. drive right over them. They don't right. care. You know, right. and we deal with that same thing too. We still want to have these effective and be imposing. Right. But do you remember how much those are roughly? Oh my gosh, the cushions and all that. Uh, individual cushions used to sell the what were those four by eights. It seemed like they were five or six thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, I think, something like that. And I guess the whole point I started talking about that was the way. Um, the manufacturer, we had those installed, we would drill a, a large hole, like 11 16th or something, put these plates down and then pour the epoxy into the hole and drop the bolt into that and yeah. let it set up. Because we're, we're looking at temporary ones. Right. And actually one of the reasons I wanted to ask about the different base sizes mm -hmm. is I'm assuming you want the longer base so you can get more adhesive, you know, get it out of Yeah, and it's a little bit more effective. So I would imagine that if you were also doing the speed hump, you could also you'd have, so have all that adhesive area, surface area, mm -hmm. to have it, yeah. so you wouldn't need to bolt it. For yeah. Sure. So, yeah. I can, I can uh, talk to a National, I'm sure that they, uh, I think one of the companies they work with, a company called GNR, it's out of uh, Canada, mm -hmm. they think they make a full-blown speed home. I have a question about color. Pardon me? Uh, I have a question about color. Sure. Um, there are these, there's this darker green, yeah. there's lighter green in here. Is, do you know if cities using the green color um, bollards of four bike lanes specifically, um, or are there some concerns in terms of it doesn't meet whatever traffic code that there would be for color of bollards? In most of the cases, it's to complement the green pavement markings that have really right. become popular the last couple, two or three years. So you try to match that color. It's a safety green, but there's no hard and fast set, you know, has to be this, whatever that color number is, no. Is there a city, do you know of a city that's using these that we could look to to show? It uses the green bollards. Um, and does it matter? Like there's no safety regulations for no. what color these things are? Matter of fact, just recently in the last year it has come up um, on that curve, and that's why I brought that green curve yeah. with me. No, I love I love the green because mm -hmm. of the the white ones just look like is a regular like it could be for anything. Highway. The green ones for us at least could be like that spikes. But I really think we should strongly consider the rain issues because I find that's the time when it's really really difficult to see things right and that and at night I I'm sure that I would see this no matter what right but the reflective stuff. Right. But where it's that dusk time that, like, between three and four in the winter time, <laughs> and when it's ra really rainy here, that I find it incredibly hard to see both driving and on my bike. Like, it just feels like everything has grayed out, and that's where the white ones would worry me. But would worry you? Would I think it would be hard to see those? They are actually the hardest. Okay. And against the grit, the, we have a lot of light gray concrete. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the, even the white paint, it's kind of... Exactly. It's out. Yeah, I feel like I don't... Yeah. And so I'd like to find the one that, you know, really yeah, held right. well right during those winter months. <laughs> not, not, not that we're, we're just about to lose that as the time's going to change. Has yeah, there been visibility? Right. Yeah, there has been. The interesting thing with the bike lanes is actually go back 10 years, and believe it or not, it was blue. That was the color the manual was saying if you're going to do a, a pavement because there was there's been epoxies, there's been these non skids, all this stuff to put in bike lanes, and that was blue back then. Portland's first uh, pavement color was blue, yeah. um, and then the federal government said yeah you shouldn't use says, that. You yeah. got to use green, so yeah. that everybody converted to green. In yeah. Europe is red. But, yeah, it's red. It's a lot. Well, there's a lot of red. It changes depending on this the this country, red. but right. yeah. Netherlands. Something about yeah. Netherlands, yeah. So they've pretty much gone to this green. Um, Paris is red too. And it is for, some of it's for contrast, some of it's just obviously to uh, 
and I, I would imagine it in more inclement weather at, at, at dusk you probably would be able to see that a little bit better. I would think yellow would be best at all, <coughs> all the light levels. Yeah. Well, know. it it, it really it'd actually be useful to get like one of each color, screw them to a board, screw them to a two by four, and stand them up to take pictures in different parts of our environment. Yeah. That way you can just see. Yeah, the only restrictions would be uh, under the manual, and this has come up a lot, bless you, on the, on the hot lanes, particularly down in Las Vegas, where they they had the sun, they had the bleed from the lights we on. Right. It's amazing on the strip. And it was on concrete. And the white posts would just, would just literally bleed out. I mean, you could not see them. So they wanted to start using orange. Well, orange is meant for safety. Right, right. And they had a huge fight inside the DOT about can they put orange, can't they? I mean, it went on for months and months and months. <laughs> they, should, they should have used black posts. Yeah, they're going to be black gonna... after a little while anyway. <laughs> So, so they, could, could, we, could we borrow this <laughs> base with all the different colors? Uh, that, we just, just introduced that down at our show. Um, yeah, I'm sure we can work something out. Like I said, our plant's just down in Tacoma, not yeah. in Fife. And if you folks get a group and you want to come through and, and have a tour, we'd be very happy to do that. But, okay. Yeah, we have those down there. What would sure. be useful would be to borrow a set, mm -hmm. take it up here. We could photograph it in our environment in many different contexts, different sure. times of day, different weathers and give you that data back sure. and that could help your own research and development. That, that way in certain cities you could show people mm -hmm. how your different colors look. It, or at least, I, mean, you know, it, I think there is this other level of uh, just helping drivers awareness of what, of telling them what's happening and that orange is like construction or yeah. safety and they will they really frown on the right? White is the edge lines, yeah. blue is hospitals, um, and other emergency services, black isn't a thing um, yet that I know of, but it could be. Um, so, you know, there, there's all these yeah. range of colors that we've applied to uh, drivers and their education of how to use And the only color. other one that they really protect is the fluorescent yellow-green, and that's school. Mm -hmm. and that's why you see that other green, and they... they School. The, the engineers, yeah, around the school zone, you see the signs are fluorescent yellow. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's like the crosswalk. Five or six yellow. years ago, yeah. It's, it's, it's that yellow. Yeah, the yield of potential. I mean, it's yellow. a yellow green. That's well, their no, green. that's, well, no, that's green. I, there's one it's here. Yeah. It's closer to that's it. That's our lime green. Lime green, green, fluorescent yellow. Yeah. Green, yeah. But we, we use that for our bike lanes. Yeah. Like this. No, but it's this one, right here. It's that. You get into these. That's oh, the but that's just yeah. fluorescent yellow. Yeah. Well, it's it has a greenish tinge yeah, to it. It's, there is see, yellow. there's like this is the yellow, and then that's the green. Yeah, it's day glow. See the difference? Yeah, they they really <laughs> frown. Yeah, on more yellow than green to me. <laughs> oh, okay. They really yeah. frown on on uh, an agency using that for a permanent you know spread across the town because it loses its effectiveness. The concept is you come into that zone, you see that color, you oh man, there's kids around. So better start paying attention. So, oh. mm -hmm. so, how so what, yeah, what are the colors that are left? Really <laughs> green. <yellow>. Green. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. How is this one attached? That, I'll, I'll get that in just a second. Because right. I said so three different go. ranges of posts right. here. Yeah. Yeah. We're going so to the Sanders game? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I right. gotta grab my tickets. Have fun. Yeah. 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 It looks like it's fun out there. <laughs> Um, um, I'll give you my card before I go. Okay, great. And I'll speed it up a little bit. So we're, really what we did, we start, obviously we're, we had the, the flexible delimiter posts. Uh, we've been making those bases for a decade and, and, and uh, when this really strong push came across the country for protecting bike lanes, it's natural that we would go to that, that one in particular. But we also have these systems. What these are called are uh, surface mount curve systems, okay? And again, these are really designed to complement pavement markings. They're not designed to replace them. These are intended for areas where the pavement markings just aren't enough. You're still having incidents, high incidence areas, to where the, the, the contractor or the, the maintenance crews themselves can come in in one day and, and, and really change the configuration of, a, of an incidence area. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different companies making them. Uh, we chose to go with a little bit more uh, uh, gentle slope because we want to be able to sell this product not only for secondary streets, you know, lower speeds, but also out on the interstate. We're the only company that has these tested and 
document and prove that they can be put out on in this interstates where you have 70 miles an hour, and if a compact car hits it, it's not going to make it lose control. Wow. So one of the tests was they had to be able to run over these things and then recover, come back. <laughs> So we have all that stuff documented. That's from 2005, 2006. So we're one of the few companies that do that, that chose to go that route. Now we have two different versions of it. It's in the catalog. Um, the other one, and I really probably should have brought that one instead of this turnpike grade, but this is the one I had in green. We make one called interstate grade, and it links together, so it's more continuous delineation, and it's more of a deterrent. Because these are designed to be gapped out. Obviously you have a gap, you're going to incline someone to dart in and out of it. So generally speaking, you'll go with uh, with what you guys are going to face. You'll go with the continuous curve system. Do you have a picture of that? In yeah, it's in, it's in that catalog. Should be added towards the front of it. And it's on the sum drive and it's on our website. That, there you go. That, this is the continuous one. Okay, yeah. page six. Yep. So again, it's just a little bit more of a deterrent. It uses the same delineator post, goes in the same way. It's pinned in with the two pins. So the, the traffic maintenance guys, they are very familiar with these. They, these have been around for 20 years or more. Uh, the original ones were all rubber. Uh, they were high maintenance. It was hard to get them, they would make them be color fast, hard to get the reflective sheeting to stick to them. These, these hard rigid plastics is where we've all gone now. And what's the distance between? Three feet. Okay, yeah. got it. If you choose to put it, you don't have to. And that's another thing to tell the engineers. You don't have, these things are so flexible as far as how they put them in and how they configure them. You can put one every other mm -hmm. post, every other base if you want. You can put it out there and come back later on and put one in. Or you can come out later and put signs on them. I mean, they're just they're And what are so we talking about? Ways. For this base, price difference? Roughly, okay, it's a rough number. If you go top of the line, the, the continuous grade yeah. installed with all the sheeting and stuff is about $50 a foot, okay. which is not that high when you consider some of the other stuff that they've been using. So we have these curved systems, um, and they have been used in bike lanes. I have a one down in Santa Cruz, the, this one, the interstate grade, it has been there six years now. Mm -hmm. And Held it was up. a counterflow lane. They had tried the colored pavements. They had tried the city sankers. They tried everything. Comes down from UCSB, and they finally went and repaved everything, and had one of my contractor customers come out and do the pavement markings. They did the bike lane and the bike, and then they put this curve system right along the edge line. And they actually put a post by every 30 feet because they have to allow the um, garbage guys to come. The garbage cans are on the, on the sidewalk. So those have been out there, I said, almost six years. Never had a bike crash on it, and haven't had one complaint from the residents. And the city has not replaced one of those curbs or one of those posts. So the city of Santa Cruz is, is a pretty good uh, advocate or really good contact if you want to talk to somebody. Chris down there would be very happy to talk to you. And they've done two or three projects since then. Hasn't taken off like I really thought it would or I wanted it to, but you know happy to get what we get, but they've probably done three different projects with this curve system. So from there we then got into these these bowlers. This is more of a what people think of a traditional bowler. And is that what is in this New York? Uh, nope, these haven't been used there yet. Oh, way towards the end of this. We just touch on there's some inclement weather. I mean these posts these curve systems can take a lot of abuse. Nothing will stand up to a snowplow if it gets a hold of it. You know? right. Fortunately, it's, we don't have to worry yeah, about that. Not too much. No. Every once in a while, I'm like, especially Alpine, he, he likes it when it snows because he sells all the reflective markers are out there. All right. <laughs> they're all off. You know? But these devices, if they're, they're in the, generally speaking, they're in a small buffer area and they will last for years. So that. how do um, the installation of these compare to those um, little reflective? Their little pavement markers? Pucks that they put, yeah. Yeah, those are generally epoxy down. Okay. So the same guys put them down, they know exactly how to put But that's usually a, a, a two-part epoxy. The epoxy is one that damages the pavement. Yeah, when you pop it, it'll pull it off. I just had one of my, I went to breakfast one of my striping contractor customers on Tuesday. And, and he was looking at our catalog and he asked about these torch down. And I think I might have jumped ahead of those because that's another system that 
you guys can probably, if you wanted to go out and just put out, you know, uh, some samples of these. All you need with this one, and again, it's on page 22. 22. It's called the Super Bundy. You need a, a weed burner. And you just clean the pavement. All these, all these adhesives, you want to make sure you have a nice clean pavement. Sweep it, you know, get all the dirt, as much dirt off as you can. You don't want any moisture. Put down one of these Super Bundies, and you heat it with the weed burner, it starts to bubble. And in this case, the manufacturer, we don't make these, we sell them. But for these delineator posts, they say you should use two of them. So you torch the first one, throw the second one on it, bubble it, stick the post in into it, kind of push it down, twist it, and it's done. And within two minutes, it cools and it's stuck. Uh, and, and some of the contractors want to use those for the raised pavement workers. Most of the DOTs don't want them using them because they're a little too flexible. But for our type of product, they work really well because these are designed to get hit. You want that shock to go and translate down into the bay, down into the pavement. So the super bunnies are a really good way of uh, putting down a you know quick. How much is that? Those are expensive. That's that's the one drawback. By the time you put two of them down, those run them for the two together. You're probably going to cost you ten dollars just for the adhesive, which is relatively expensive. How so you won't see really big projects using those. How big is it? It's an eight by eight. Did you, you already asked to take the base? It's cool enough, there's a better one of these. So, question. Uh huh. So, with the, uh, the pedestrian crosswalk market, is there a better one? Is there one of those that can actually take a hit? We've improved ours dramatically. I mean, again, one of our competitors in back recovery, they were probably the pioneers in those. Um, and they have still have a good system. It's pretty expensive. They've, they've improved theirs. But ours, that's come a long ways the last two or three years and mainly on the we finally settled on a really good braze resistant sheeting because that usually what happens is they get hit so much they they just start to look really bad and the sheeting gets torn off and, um, so ours holds up really well and it's pretty cost effective mm -hmm. so from the curb systems we got into these these uh, removable bollards and the whole concept of this again is like when I started out talking was you want to minimize the target value. And this one has the least amount of target value with the most durability. This is the most durable uh, yeah. channelizer, delineator, bollard that we've ever made. This one can take 200 hits at 70 miles an hour and still come <laughs> back up. I mean, it's amazingly strong. Uh, it's a complete system. And the nice advantage of it is um, if you have special events or if they want to get in and work and do some maintenance, it's a quick spin-out design, so you core out the pavement, epoxy this flush just below the surface, and then the post screws down tight. And once it's down, it looks really imposing. It looks like a steel, like a bollard. And most people will drive along and see that, and they'll go, man, that's probably going to do some damage to my car, so they avoid it. Some people, some drivers will run over anything. They don't care. And people, I say, well, when they figure out they can run over it, what are you going to do? I mean, you know. So this one goes in and out quickly. It's installed. It's very durable, very color fast. We can make them in any color. We can sheet them any height because we make them ourselves. So it's a really nice system, and the target value is very small. But this one's about $125 list, so it's expensive. They're generally going to be gapped out. Using the, using the um, speeds we're talking about, 25, 30 miles an hour, you're probably going to put them 8 to 10 feet on center. So by the time you do the math and average it out, it's not outrageously expensive. But when I meet with these traffic engineers and these maintenance guys and you tell them 125, they go, oh gosh, you know, you buy that one for 20. <laughs> There's a trade-off. You know, it's cost. And, and the installation obviously takes a little bit more uh, time. But this is the same... The guys that we work with, the guys that actually install this stuff, most of them do a lot of sign work. And the core drill they use for this cup is the same one that they put the signs in with. So almost all of them, when they see that, and they know exactly what we're talking about. So they're not, that's not a big barrier to uh, us promoting or selling the product. Most of them do that every week. 
it seems like a good application for that would be the the center post, the intersections on protected bike lanes. Mm -hmm. you know, like a two-way bike lane mm -hmm. up on Capitol Hill. And they, they bought a little street sweeper thing now that should be able to go through right there. Well, that's another advantage the, of the this post removal. Is if they want to get in and do maintenance, you right. can spin them right. out. You know? That's what I was thinking. Yeah, I was down in Long Beach a year or so ago. They put out about 200 of the delineary posts. And again, they got the contract to put them in. He got, got them off the internet really cheap. Hard plastic. The engineer had it in his office. He went out and picked one up and brought it in before it came in. And one of the things we talked about was quick removal uh, because they sweep every week. Uh, so, so they actually remove them to sweep? Well, that's the, that's the key. I mean, he led me right into my presentation. Like, oh, man, you just you, you spoon-fed this to me. I'm going to show you this perfect system. And, and his argument against it was, he goes, I can't send a guy out in front of that street sweeper every once a week and have him walking down the street unscrewing those things. And I just <laughs> what am I going to do? I mean, All right. you know? <laughs> yeah, if, you're, if you're not going to do that, can I help you? <laughs> I mean, there's, there's always going to be an argument against every one of these devices. There's, there's no perfect system in any of them. But, uh, you know, they're out in the street all the time. And if, if, yeah. they, if they set it up correctly, and I, it's just a barrier to entry. Once you get them going on these types, this is something new. I mean, it hasn't been, the concept's been around for about a decade. But to take it out and put it out into the street was a, was a real hurdle. We had to really improve the durability of this post. We've been working on this for about five years to get to this point. We had some cheaper, less expensive versions of it. There, there is no solution to street sweeping, <coughs> though, right? I mean, other than just getting a small enough street sweeper. To, Almost. Yeah. Particularly <coughs> like a single bike lane. Does Seattle have any protected single bike lanes, and do they sweep them? Um, yes, the one going up, actually they put in with the reasonably applied Seattle lights, yeah. is a single uphill bike lane that's protected okay. with bollards. And I think that's too narrow to be swept, because I think the, they bought the new sweepers. Right, but I think that's, oh, that's, that's still like a wide. vehicle sized sweeper, right? Like I'm not sure, because they, they have little hand part ones too. Oh, they do. But I'm not sure exactly what Seattle bought. I think they bought a little mini car one, like you were saying. Hmm. I'm not sure the dimensions on it, though. So something, something else we've been... Oh. So many questions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe Selena knows this, too, but if a community group wanted to put in like a, like planner boxes, what kind of regulations are required? Oh, man. You're, you're into the building code and... That's something you definitely have to talk to your traffic engineers about, because that can be right. some pretty serious stuff there. Yeah, I'm just wondering, are there the requirements for reflectors and that type of thing? It should be. If it's out in the street, generally speaking, it's supposed to have some level of reflectivity on it. But like I said, some of those things got into uh, into the actual, out of the manual and traffic devices and got into the building code. So that hmm. really gets complicated. Yeah. That's way above my pay grade. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Um, We're looking at the right of way improvement manual. Yeah, that stuff. Yeah. What's that? The, the planner boxes? I know Portland's yeah, right, right. done some of those. They've been kind of moving towards them. A few of them. Didn't you do that? For your urban design class? Oh, um. For the waterfront? Yeah, we didn't We didn't focus on that. I mean, those were like. We, we didn't look at the planner boxes themselves. Like, we looked at what goes in the planner boxes, but not. Oh. Not the planner boxes that have a little oh, okay. material and stuff. Yeah. I mean, we've had people use our curb system and our post, and we just call them pedestrian havens, stuff like that. What? And I see those around, not not everywhere, but I see them. And again, it's the same kind of concept. If if you, if they want to try that 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 concept, I'll repeat myself. If they want to try that, they can use these type of products to go out and set up a trial. Right. Relatively inexpensive. They put it out pretty quickly. They can evaluate it and then say, okay, that's a good plan. Let's Let's, let's put it into the design, you know, and bid it out. Because um, one, of, one of the things I hear a lot from cyclists more than anything is that they don't yeah. want protected bike lanes because they don't get swept. And like on the east side in Bellevue, we have we have a few that are just no one rides in them because they're you know one's right right. They, they have just a, a stretch of it and there's like an apple tree right there and so you've got all these apples falling they don't sweep it and there's pine trees and everything and 
Huh. This that was one of the reasons, and this is in Evanston, Illinois. It's not my state, but that was one of the really selling points of this post was they yeah. could get in there, and obviously they get snow, they get winter, they get all that yeah. stuff, so they could screw these out, and apparently they actually do it, and then they can come in and do their maintenance, clean them all up, and then put them back. And we actually make a little plug, so if they want to take them out seasonally, you yeah. can cap this putt, so it seals huh. it up, so they come back in the spring and pull that pull that plug out and screw the post right back in. Do you, you Would you have to plug it if you're just sweeping? No. Would, it wouldn't... Uh, it doesn't hurt. It. No? Right, fill up with fill sand. up with fill stuff. Up. Yeah. yeah. So that was one of the, I know one of the selling points of our of our manufacturer rep and our salesman when we met with these folks back there. This was their first go around on these on the green bike things. But but that probably makes maintenance prohibitive. I mean, if you're doing that even every couple of months. Right. Yeah. Once they get used to the concept, I don't think it's a huge deal. But like I said, I was with that engineer and. Yeah. <laughs> I, think I can't really send a guy out there and have walk in front of that yeah, machine. Have the ends so, either open or have one of these guys open. <laughs> what do they so use? One of, the, uh, one of the base options here is What's the they 10 pound use, portable they use these? rubber cookie rubber base. Rubber <laughs> <laughs> that is, that's just, do they use that's not epoxy down, down or anything. Yeah. Just for the bike lanes? Strictly temporary, that's right. usually for crossing guards. Sorry. I'm having sounds coming from all directions. Go ahead. What else do they use to protect bike lanes in cities? Anything? Do they use rumble strips? They have some rumble strips. You guys actually have one set. I should have gone back and looked, and I went. I tracked down the, the, the guy that was in charge of that project, and there's these little blocks, or you guys must see it. They're about 18 inches tall, and they're interconnected. Oh, yeah. Do you know that one I'm talking about? Yeah, there's one up on 65th. There's one up on 65th. They yeah. did a bi uh, protected bike lane with it. Yeah, yeah but they call that, uh, don't they call that a, a cycle track, right? No, we, we call it a protected bicycle protected lane. Bike lane. <laughs> yeah. And, and those that, are little here, those, get over here. Is that? 18 inches tall something like or that, something yeah. like that. And, I, and I, where that came from, I guess they used that in a uh, construction no, project or something, and they re reappropriated, they oh. reused it, yeah. Oh. Interesting. But they said the cost was, and I, again, I know I got it buried in here, the guy I talked to, um, he said the cost of it to actually try to implement it everywhere was way too expensive. But so it's supposed to move, I guess it gets hit, and they can move it back. That's so not they, that's not the 65th. So, so they can use yeah. it when they're street no, the sweeping. That one, no, that's concrete. more permanent. You, I don't know how the heck no. they would. They'd have to get to, from Magnus. I don't really. I should drive up there one of these days and see. It. So they can use this one. Correct. Street street. That's def. That's yeah. definitely. Yeah. Like, oh, I mean, yeah. race yeah. Sure. Okay. Things yeah. that they had from something. But not that. They, yeah. Well, the Roma strips, yeah. Those are serious. This is down in Fife. Those are out there for those like seven or eight years. Maybe you already covered this. Yeah, street sweepers. Okay, so all of these basically could be used for street sweepers. Yeah, they're not. I don't know, actually. They're pretty, they're pretty messy. Yeah. Which is why the community was kind of annoyed that they were talking about a protected bike lane for the rest of 65th. This, this giant concrete highway barriers. Yeah. I think we're thinking of different things. Could be. Because I don't, I, I don't know these. Okay, so, um, yeah, the, the port, can you talk about the 10 pound portable rubber cookie base? That's really, those are for, uh, we call that our green uh, cross, and those are made basically for uh, crossing guards that can carry them in and out every day. They're very lightweight, and you can't really put much of a, a post or a sign. You can't put the yield of head signs on them. They, they can't, they just blow over. Will they take these? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Three. Those are strictly temporary. Uh, that's on page 21. Yeah. So do those require uh, pinning, or can you just like... That one just kind of, it's a friction fit. You just shove it into that base. Oh, the so one just below it is a... Uh, temporary. Yeah. Yeah, the one just below it is a 40-pound banana base. That's got a lot more bulk to it. I mean, if you drag that out and drop it, and we've had some people do that. They do it twice a day. They they put the yield of head signs or screw crossing signs, and they drag it out in the morning, yeah. and then come back and take it out, and then come back at two or three. And the kids are out there, and they drag it out there. You've got a there. It's not really that much. <laughs> we've, asked pe we've had people ask us many, can't you put wheels on that? <laughs> Something else we've been talking about are rubberized uh, curb ramps. Do those exist? To meet the ADA? Well, not necessarily. Where would that be applicable on a bike? So, well, oh, we, we, do, we do more than bikes. Oh, okay. Um, San Jose, where I live, put in some of the... I can't remember what they call them. They had a, uh, it's a piece of, it's a rubber curb, like I was mentioning earlier. I actually sold myself way back when. Um, this company introduced it 
targeted it toward bike lanes, and it has a, a flat face that's supposed to face the parking side, and then it's a tapered rubber on the other side. And they put them down there by San Jose State, um, something like two or three hundred feet of it. And uh, I just happened to drive it a month or so ago, and, and it was the same problem that they had. They haven't really overcome it. They get dirty, they get hit, the, the sheeting starts to come off, and then whatever color they paint them starts to fade. So they're pretty high maintenance type stuff. But there is something out there, kind of like yeah. that. All right. Yeah. Back, I don't. Back. The city hasn't done any sense. Uh, okay. They actually bought some of these and haven't gotten to put them in yet. So, the so, so one of the one of the ideas we're working with is uh, Barbara mentioned before she left. It's a pop up greenway, and we've had mm -hmm. some just with signage, basically, and paint. But now we're looking at kind of a, a 2.0 kit with a pop rubber. Up, pop up greenway. Yeah, so neighborhood greenways are just low speed, low traffic streets that are huh. prioritized for walking and biking, huh. basically using stop signs, speed humps, uh -huh. and uh, protected intersection uh -huh. treatments, various kinds. Um, so we're looking at slightly more permanent signs, mm -hmm. slightly better speed humps instead of currently they're just painted speed humps, mm -hmm. which I don't do anything obviously. And then some kind of rubberized curb cuts, because oftentimes curb cuts come in as part of the Greenway projects, and then looking at some kind of temporary intersection treatments too. So that's um, one of the things we're looking at. And actually one of the things I, I wanted to ask about as well was, so if there are Greenways that are being designed that don't have sidewalks currently, um, and so one option is just to have people kind of walk, you know, do aggressive speed pumps, slow down traffic and just have people walk on the street. But, um, are any what what would you suggest just to kind of delineate a sidewalk? A sidewalk on the sidewalk itself, or no, no, as there's no sidewalk, it's mm. just pavement. Um, you know, cut out whatever four feet for. Again, I'm not an engineer. Okay. I don't count myself as an engineer. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, and when you're in the sidewalk realm, and I'm repeating myself, but that stuff starts to get into the building code and. All kinds of it. you know. It sounds like you've studied some of this stuff. It but gets pretty complicated. But, um, we've had people do uh, again uh, pedestrian havens. They do uh, bulb outs. They do uh, um, if it's not a if it's not so an I existing guess, sidewalk. I guess I guess a bulb out would kind of work the same. Pork chops or just something to slow people down or to pinch the pinch the. But I mean, so yeah. do you have, do you have temporary bulb outs too? You can use these curbs for that, yeah. Wow. Yeah. But what do, what do people, like, what specifically do people use? Do they just they, these, these posts, or are they using... On the sidewalks, or... Uh, I understand your question, I guess. So if you're doing a temporary curb, you, know, you have the sidewalk here, and I'm assuming you're coming out. Further. Yeah. Yeah, some guy, some injured call them pork chops, and they're in a weird, rounded shape. Right. And so they, they do a couple of things as they... They, it, a lot of that has to do with people that are coming down and they make really rapid turns yeah, right. and they actually yeah. go into the other lane and that's to, yeah. to stop that to prevent it mm -hmm. and to stop, um, a lot of times to stop uh, yeah. illegal turns. Mm -hmm. So they'll use these raised curbs and some of them put posts on them, some of them don't. Okay. And then eventually, like I said, they, the most majority of them I've seen is they do it on a temporary basis just to test the concept and then eventually they come out with concrete, poured concrete, okay. colored concrete stuff. Yeah, that's, that's the idea behind these, these pop-up greenways. Do like a five block segment, mm -hmm. test it out for a few months, mm -hmm. community either buys off on it or they want changes mm -hmm. and then move that kit somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's what we're thinking about building. Yeah. Yeah, and all of our products and a lot of our, our competitors, we, we, we our products lend themselves to that concept. We're, they can be permanent, they can be temporary. Um, I'm trying to think if I have any of that. I'm not going to keep you guys any longer, and I think I'm, my parking's expired. Oh, but um, we should, we should but um, I will uh, make sure I dig out some of the pictures on what we've been talking about and I'll email them to you. Great. And some are right here in Washington. I was just over in Port Townsend. My wife was with me around Christmas time. I saw a couple in Port Townsend. They had the little pedestrian havens they had done with our post and base. It just turned out to be our stuff. Mm -hmm. And they did a, uh, they did a, uh, it, to me it looked like it was a concept of a, of a uh, planter box type thing, but they didn't want to put a planter box out there. Mm -hmm. And it actually had a little area where the people could pipe their, park their bikes in there. It was kind of a good little concept. Yeah, I think that what 
walkable city institute or something like that is <clears throat> in Port Townsend. That's mm -hmm. why oh, Port exactly. Townsend's getting oh, okay. better. Hmm. Sounds like we should do a field trip to National Barricade. Or the or Auburn, Alpine. Auburn one. Alpine, Alpine yeah. yeah. Alpine is the one. Yeah, he has a great showroom. There's all the stuff out and displayed. And, National Park is easy for me. Yeah. <laughs> National doesn't have much of a no. showroom now. They're more of a, a traffic control. It, besides, we just take the inner urban down. <laughs> Dobbin. Huh? All right. Yeah. I've never done that. Um, any other questions or anything else I can answer for you? Or? Um, on this space here, mm -hmm. one, one question that, that sure. I had was for, for installation, how do you hold the base in the correct orientation while the epoxy hardens? Do you have like a special thing you screw in here to, to keep it perpendicular to the ground yeah. so you could finish off the epoxy and let it set before you uh, install the post? Not, not a tool per se, but we have pretty explicit uh, installation instructions on how they should core that, what the depth is, and, and uh, how it should be um, cleaned out, and, and, and then exactly how much epoxy you should put in, and, mm -hmm. uh, that type of stuff. Like I said, most of the guys that are installing these uh, have experience with it. They've already done a lot of core drilling, but it's not something a lay person would just immediately take tubes. And it does take some knowledge and you have to have some pretty substantial equipment to core out concrete or asphalt. Yeah. But it is important that you get them perpendicular. Right. Okay. All right. Do you have any of these in green? What's that? The baby road markers. Uh, we can make anything in any color for a certain amount of a certain quantity, but normally it's their white or yellow. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what about the, so anything you can make? For yeah. a certain quantity. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's always we always have a minimum on, on this is on page twenty. Stuff. And even we've had that question a lot on on the rumble strips. Can you make them in colors? Yeah, we're a plastic company. We can do anything. But you know, the minimum run on that's probably five thousand pieces. So. How much is are these baby? Ones? The little baby ones. I think they're a dollar seventy five cents. Yeah, they're non reflective. They're really meant for um, layout guys that are doing striping that are gonna. gonna oh. Yeah, oh, they're going to do it in this yeah. Yeah, because they're non-reflective, so they yeah. can't. They're not really meant to reflect at night, but yeah. the, they just uh, can right. lay it out, and then the big truck comes by and strikes mm -hmm. right over. Cool. And they just pull them off. Nice. Okay. Thanks. Hey, thank you guys. Well, thank Appreciate you. it very much.